president of Westwood Historical, along with Laura Provost. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, June Cassidy, who used to be on our board, she's not here tonight, at least not yet. She continues to help us by doing PR with the Hometown Weekly and other publications, so I did want to mention her. I also wanted to tell you about an event that we're hosting in this very room, uh, December 7th. It's a holiday type of fair where the Westwood artisans come and they transform the room into a shopping type of winter thing. Um, tonight, we're fortunate to have John Morgan with us yet again. He's a five-time Emmy Award-winning historian, co-creator, I believe, or maybe creator of the his folklorist. And as far as I've seen, he's the most animated historian that we've seen here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I give you John. Thank you, Marilyn. Hello, everyone. So nice to be here back at Fisher House and uh, talking about the Pilgrims 403 years after, right? So the Westwood Historical Society has been very kind to me and it's great. And hello to all the viewers on cable television. So as Marilyn mentioned, I, I was lucky enough to host a show called The Folklorist, which was produced out of New TV in Newton, Massachusetts, a great talented staff. And somehow I won five Emmy Awards, Boston, New England Emmy Awards. And um, we also won a boatload. I had 20 nominations personally, 13 telly awards, seven communicator awards. And then new TV went back to back in Newton, first place arts and entertainment with the Alliance of Community Media. But the show was canceled in 2016 because it was a critically acclaimed show that nobody was watching. <laughs> but it was great. And it's being shown still in Westwood today, so, but a great time. And, and I've been called many things, a time traveler driving without a license, the old Boston <laughs> Phoenix called me. I used to be so upset when I read that, and now I wear it like a badge. I'm also a professional sports announcer. I've worked with the uh, Boston Red Sox, the Boston Bruins, uh, National Hockey League. I work currently with the Boston Bruins alumni, and I've traveled with the Toronto Maple Leafs, Montreal Canadiens across Canada. <laughs> Um, I'm, I think I'm the only one ever to announce a baseball game and a hockey game outdoors at Fenway Park in Gillette Stadium. And I, I, was, I, was in the comedy I was nominated to the Comedy Basketball Hall of Fame, which is kind of a joke, to see what I did with that. Um, but I traveled with the Harlem Rockets, Harlem Wizards uh, throughout the 90s. And that was me uh, many years ago, <laughs> different now. So I'm still working with the Boston Bruins alumni. Um, I'm in my unofficially 31st season, but officially 20th season with them. And you can go to bostonbruinsalumni.com and see some of the games. Good. I'm also a former historical reenactor, various historical societies. Um, I'm a member of the Society in Dedham for Apprehending Horse Thieves. I think in over 212 years, they've never apprehended a horse thief, but they have a great banquet every year. And I, I love economics history, especially now. Former colonial reenactor with the Lincoln Minutemen, and then... I portrayed uh, Alex, Alexander Hamilton with Solo together poorly, I might add. I drive this with text because I work with a lot of hearing impaired groups um, and also uh, poor listeners like myself. And I'm dedicating this to Dr. Jeremy Bangs, who passed away. He's a leading authority on the pilgrims, arguably in the world. I like Nathaniel Philbrook. He's awesome. Uh, David um, uh, Childress, uh, but, but this guy here, he, he called uh, universities academe the strong arm of ignorance, and that, that's close to my heart. But he was a curator at Plymouth Plantation in the 80s, um, at Patuxent it's known as today, which is great. And he also founded the Leiden American Pilgrim Museum in the Netherlands, author, scholar, and again, Uncle uh, so where go, Jeremy. And he gave me a different perspective to look at this. We're going to just look at uh, the pilgrims, Puritans, separatists, we're going to look at the Mayflower, the voyage, the great dying, which was the disease, the women of the Mayflower, which I'm excited about, the five landings. We're going to trace their, um, all of their journeys. And then uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Tisquantum or Squanto, or we'd be maybe speaking Spanish or French. So um, the calendar, you're going to see old style, new style dates. Just uh, we had to align, uh, move from the Julian calendar, which was seasonal, seasonal, to um, a more, um, uh, uh, which was actually seasonal to a holiday calendar of Gregorian. So in other words, September 2nd, 1752 was followed by September 14th, 1752. So if I were to say, well, on September 3rd, 1752, you'd say, John, that's fake news. There wasn't a seven. 
But anyways, um, and a guy won a bet basically saying that he could dance from uh, February 2nd when England cut over in the calendar through, uh, through uh, February 14th. And of course, it was the next day he won the bet. All right. So the Puritans believed that it was necessary to go back to the absolute beginning of Christianity before the church had been corrupted. Um, the only truths they believe were in the Old and New Testament, and if it wasn't in the Bible, it was a man-made distortion of what God intended. Even the hymns were a corruption of God's word. They were pious people. And of course, English Protestants in the 16th and 17th centuries sought to purify the Church of England of Roman Catholic practices, maintaining that the Church of England had not been fully reformed and should become more Protestant. And since the coronation of James I in 1603, Pressure to conform the Church of England was mounting. Of course, he reformed the Bible. And the king thought that all Puritans were troublemakers, and he wanted to, quote, uh, he, they were a threat to his power, but he wanted to harry them out of the land. Go away. And then the separatists were within the Puritan group, and they determined that the Church of England was not a true Church of Christ at all. Heresy. And in 1607, the Bishop of York found out about separatist gatherings, and he began spying on them. Some were even imprisoned. And then the king wanted them out of England. But in order to leave England, you'd need a permit from the king. So if they were to sail for Holland to a, a new area to worship and not be persecuted, they would need the king's permission or do it in secret. Now, this is William Bradford. I had hair like that in college, I think. I looked. Anyways, William Bradford grew up in Osterfield, northern Nottinghamshire. He attended religious services in a nearby village called Scrooby. That's where we come from, as Scrooby, believe it or not. Um, and he met the postmaster there, William Brewster. And along with other separatists, they listened to the preaching of John Robinson. Robinson never made the voyage across the Atlantic. So there were gatherings. These separatists were breaking not only out of the Puritan faith, but from the Church of England. And their escape originally didn't go well. Um, the, they hired a first captain to take them to Holland. He turned them in, took their money, turned them in, and uh, the people in the town of Boston in Lincolnshire, England, actually imprisoned some of the pilgrims. So after several months, they were released, and they finally secured the services of a trustworthy Dutch captain. But unfortunately, the local militia actually pursued them to the docks, and they got onto the ships, but they had to leave their women, uh, the, their wives, and their children here. Eventually, the wives and the children would catch up with them a few months later in Holland. So it really, they were sailing for their lives. Now, the, in Holland, they were considered to be social outcasts. Um, they weren't Dutch. And moreover, one of the, uh, some of the things that uh, uh, an impetus for the pilgrims to leave Holland was, were because their children were, were becoming too Dutch. So that's Leiden, and that's where my Uncle Jeremy was. And uh, John Robinson led them to the city of Leiden, and they faced limited persecution, but they were avoided by the Dutch. Now, William Bradford sold his estate in Osterfield, and he settled into Leiden as a corduroy worker, a type of fabric, corduroy pants. I finally gave them away, um, but once upon a time, he used to wear them every day. And he married Dorothy May in 1613. And they had a son named John in 1617, and unfortunately, they left him behind, and poor Dorothy was depressed. She suffered from depression. In fact, um, she would, I don't mention it here, but she would leap off. She would fall off the Mayflower. I think that she, she cast herself off it out of depression. And I can just imagine how horrible it is, especially for a mother. Your child's 3,000 miles away, and you're in this cold, frosty area, desolate area, and there are natives that don't want you there. So, Anyways, William Bradford, get this, is my great, 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 great grandfather. All right, and Thomas Rogers, who was also on the Mayflower and died in 1620, and my wife is much younger than me, it's her great, 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 great grandfather. So William Brewster drew the ire of England, of the English aristocracy, when he published, with the help of Edward Winslow, a separatist pamphlet that criticized the Church of England and King James. So he had to go into hiding because a bounty was put on his head. So while he was in hiding, Brewster was hiding, John Carver and Robert Cushman, who helped coordinate the voyage across, the, voyage across the ocean, he never went on the Mayflower, um, he took up negotiations with, in London 
And by June 1619, a year before they departed, he secured a charter from the Virginia Company, who, who essentially laid claim to the New World, lands of the New World, on behalf of England. But the pilgrims or the separatists were broke. They needed somebody to finance their expedition. And the Dutch government, when they heard, they're thinking about taking a voyage. They better not go to New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam is what city today? New York. New York City. Thank you, sir. Well done. Ten points. Circle gets the square. Um, so he, he, they were trying to uh, subvert them in their efforts to go ashore. So the pilgrims got this English merchant by the name of Thomas Weston and 70 of his British partners. They were known as the merchant adventurers to finance the expedition. Now Weston saw two opportunities, investment and also a way for these pilgrims to plant their religion in a new land. Please bring a fishing rod. They forgot a fishing rod. But uh, their charter specified that they could establish a settlement in northern Virginia. Now, northern Virginia, in their eyes, was New Amsterdam or the mouth of the Hudson River in New York. So the adventurers, Weston's joint stock company, financed the voyage, and they thought they could generate profits through the cod, fishing, and fur trade, and also timber. And by the 15th century, virtually almost every forest had been cut down in England and by Europe. So when they saw these trees, the previous explorers, it was something, wow, wood. <laughs> so for the next seven years, the pilgrims said that they would pay off the debt. They'd work five days a week. One day a week, they'd work for themselves, and one day rest on the Sabbath. And then Cushman and about a, hundred, a third of the pilgrims in Holland, there was about 380, depending upon who you talk to, a third of them uh, were prepared to go west for the journey. But then Weston changed the terms of the agreement, saying you got to work six days a week and only one day a week for Sabbath, not a day to work for yourselves. And Cushman, Robert Cushman, agreed to that without consulting the pilgrims. And then there's Christopher Martin. You have some ornery people, and he's one of them. He wanted The pilgrims wanted to reach the uh, Hudson River, New Amsterdam, before winter, obviously. Ideally, get there late spring, right, summer, and plant your crops and get yourself established. And Weston uh, now wanted to add non-separatists um, to the journey. Uh, they wanted to, they called them strangers. Uh, and amongst them was a wicked man by the name of Christopher Martin, had a sailor's mouth and just despised the pilgrims. But these were other uh, strong men that they thought could build the homes, do um, the gardening, plant the crops, etc. So the pilgrims purchased a 60-ton vessel named the Speedwell, and the pilot was a man named Reynolds. I've been searching for his first name. I don't know. But by the end of July now, and the clock's ticking, they still, uh, the, they had made their way to uh, Delshaven, or Delshaven, where the Speedwell was waiting for them. And the plan was to ro for them to rendezvous in Southampton, England, with their supposed provisions, and then with another ship would be waiting for them, and then they'd sail. Well... It was a sad, mournful parting, according to William Bradford, as, again, his wife Dorothy had to leave their three-year-old son John behind with Dorothy's parents. I can only imagine the heartbreak that she went through. And the speedwell was only 50 feet in length. It was refitted with two larger masts to endure the crossing of the Atlantic. But there were some engineering mistakes there. And uh, eventually this modification would make her unseaworthy. That high a mast would actually pull the boards apart and she would leak like a sieve. Now, the Mayflower was the second ship that they were going to lease. It was a square-rigged merchant ship, and it was about 100 feet in length and could carry 180 tons or 180 casks of wine. But if you look at this here, all the people, especially during stormy weather, would be packed downstairs. You were cramped, and everybody knew everybody's business. There was no privacy. And again, 80, it was 80 by 20 feet, the living quarters there. And again, two months was the voyage, 66 days it would last, and uh, they would be cramped together. But on board, they had chickens and sheep and goats. These were not native to the New World. And they had two dogs, an English Spaniel roof, and a giant Mastiff. Any dog owners? <laughs> yep. So, and then, of course, uh, Master Christopher Jones, and I like this guy. Um, he, he knew his way around a ship. He knew how to navigate and sail. He crossed the English Channel with a cargo of wine several times, and he went as far as Scandinavia and even Greenland, but he had not gone all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. But they called the Mayflower a sweet ship because it smelled of wine, and it would tamp down the odor emanating from the bilge. 
Now, Jones's mate, his co-pilot, was Robert Coppin, and he had already been to America previously. And 21-year-old John Alden, I'll go back to him, he was a cooper, making all the casts and barrels on board the Mayflower. And also was Miles Standish, a mercenary, ex-military, designated to be in charge of all military affairs, along with his wife, Rose. We had Elder William Brewster. He was joined by his wife, Mary, and their sons, I love these names, Love and Wrestling. And Stephen Hopkins was on board the Mayflower, along with his pregnant wife, Elizabeth, his son, Giles, and his daughters, Constance and Damaris, along with two servants, Edward Doty and Edward Lester. Now, um, he, Hopkins had been to America previously aboard the Sea Venture, and we believe that the Sea Venture was used in Shakespeare's The Tempest, that that story is based on that. Edward Winslow, and uh, uh, again, some of the tie to the story um, with my lineage going back to the Mayflower, my parents lived on land formerly owned by Edward Winslow and the Winslow family. And I spoke at the Winslow house and I pointed out that this is where um, King Alexander, Massasoit's son, was poisoned and they didn't like that. But anyways, he, Winslow came with his wife Elizabeth and John Clark, also a co-pilot, he had been to America before, crossed the Atlantic on a ship. Giles Healy was the ship's physician. And John Carver's wife, Catherine, along with five servants, were passengers as well. And we'll go over that. So the honorary Christopher Martin, he was the one who despised the, uh, the pilgrims. He was designated as the Mayflower's governor. And he traveled with his wife and two servants, along with four additional families, the Mullinses, the Eatons, and the Billingtons, those bad neighbors. Uh, Bradford called them one of the most profanest families amongst them. And I think he was understating it. But uh, Ellen, Jasper, Richard, and Mary Moore were sent on the voyage by their stepfather, Samuel. And then, of course, John Billington, a drunkard uh, and troublemaker. He was joined by his brash wife, Eleanor, and their undisciplined sons, John and Francis. More about them in a bit. No more financial support, though. After a disagreement with Thomas Weston, uh, he pulled his financial backing of the voyage and walked off the ship. The pilgrims were forced to sell off some of their provisions. So again, they're being delayed. They're trying to get across the Atlantic um, late spring. Now it's late summer. And Martin now is becoming a despot. You know, people that get power and they're just very hard to deal with, cursing all the pilgrims. And Cushman, uh, Robert Cushman, he's the one who said, hey, we'll work six days a week. Um, he made sure that he was on the other vessel away from Martin on the Speedwell. So they get two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. And after departing Southampton, the Speedwell became as open and leaky as a sieve. And several days after clearing the island of Wight, they had to turn back and head to Dartmouth for repairs. And it's now August 17th. Time's running. And they had to await the westerly winds that um, uh, pop up in early fall, late summer. And while they were waiting, what did they do? They consumed all their provisions. That was all the food they had. So half of their provisions for the trip that were to last them into the new year were gone. And about 200 miles off the coast of um, southwest England is where the Speedwell turned around along with the Mayflower. They went back to Plymouth. And um, some people said that the, the loss of the ship was costly, but some people blamed Reynolds with the new masts that he didn't want to go across the Atlantic, and he forced um, this ship to be a hazard. I think it was just poor engineering. So, again, Leiden goes to Speedwell, hooks up with the Mayflower, Southampton. They, they cast off from Plymouth. they got to turn around, so they're back in Plymouth now. And Cushman then, Robert Cushman, left the group. He says, I'm not going with you. That leaves 102 passengers left, and then 50, uh, less than 50 were separatists. So there's 102 people now going across the Atlantic, down from 125. So it's September 6th, old style. September 16th, New Style, under what Bradford described as a prosperous wind, they took off from Plymouth and headed west. Now, the first half of the voyage of the Mayflower was calm, calm seas. I mean, if you think about it, they're really traveling during hurricane season. Um, but pleasant skies, but then the northeasterly winds turned, and they had some problems, huge waves crashing against the deck. And in the midst of the storm, the servant of physician uh, Samuel Fuller died and was buried at sea. 
So can you imagine being cooped up and getting thrown from side to side? If you've ever been seasick before, it, it, don't even think. So another fear, fear stored the sails couldn't be used and the ship drifted without hoisting its sails for like three days. Passengers were crouching in semi-darkness below deck as 40-foot uh, swells rose over the Mayflower and tossing the passengers in each direction and they were chilled, they were wet and cold. Human beings need to stay warm and dry. And with wet and cold comes disease. So the main beam of the Mayflower was, um, was cracked, so they thought it would sink, but they brought what was known as a metal jack screw that they were going to be using for the construction of settler homes, and that actually did the job and held the main beam in place. So they were lucky. But now they're nearly out of food. And again, this would take 66 days. And they were low on drinking water, but more importantly, beer. Back in those days, we are lucky we drink water. They drank alcohol because water had so many diseases within them. And um, they would rather drink alcohol, which didn't have disease in them. Even kids would drink beer. But they were now low on drinking water and beer. Um, and again, when somebody became sick, so did everybody else. And there were vitamin deficiencies, right? No D, sunshine, no C, no fruit. And they, didn't, of course, didn't know this back in the 17th century. Um, and strangely, uh, Miles Dennish never got sick. There, those people that have the Constitution, I, I know a guy, I've never had a cold in his life. And it's like, wow. Anyways, this is a cool story. It's a violent storm, one of many. And John Howland, a servant, he goes up topside for a breath of fresh air. Now, now um, he might have tried to smoke a pipe because smoking in Plymouth in 1623 was banned outdoors. Yet you can only smoke indoors because the embers from the pipe would get blown into the thatch roofs. So my how times have changed. Anyways, um, Howland falls overboard. He's swept off the deck of the Mayflower. Incredibly, as he was falling to the sea, he managed to grab onto a rope, right, a, a halyard, dangling alongside the ship. He's screaming, he goes 10 feet underwater, and he's pulled aboard with a, a boat hook and saved. People save him. Can you believe this? And he would go on to marry Elizabeth Tilly, who was considered the prettiest girl on the Mayflower. And um, they would go on to marry, have 11 children and 88 grandchildren. And then check this out. And I've met descendants. Today, their diaspora and line of heritage can account for over 1.5 million people across the world. And I've met descendants of, of John Howland. Go figure. Anyways, um, it was tedious, two miles per hour. They weren't making time. The, they, this stream, the Gulf Stream, they knew nothing about it, was, was inhibiting them and, and pulling them north. They were trying to go south. Um, Christopher Jones, um, the... the captain of the ship of the Mayflower, a very good sailor, he was using John Smith's map. Now, John Smith, you know about him, I call him the great exaggerator. He once claimed to have cut off three men's head in a sword fight, walked across Russia. I, I don't believe in the Pocahontas story at all, okay, so, but in Virginia, but he was a, a blowhard. Anyways, he wanted to go on the Mayflower, and of course, John Smith would name who as the leader of the expedition? John Smith. And he said, tell you what, Mr. Smith, we'll take your map, but you can stay here. So anyways, um, Smith had been previously to New England in 1614. In fact, he'd been down the Charles River in Watertown, um, the Great Bridge there. That's how far John Smith got down the Charles River. And he went with another ship commanded by Thomas Hunt, two ships in 1614. He was a marvelous cartographer, so accurate with his maps. And as he came up the coast, of course, he got into a fracas with the Quornahasset natives um, and Quonahasset, Cohasset today, and I was talking earlier about the glades where the rocks were, and uh, he killed one and, and wounded another. Welcome to America. Here come, here come the explorers, the appropriators. So um, he was very, very lucky, but without Smith and his map, the pilgrims wouldn't, wouldn't have got here. So anyways, what he did is he turned around, he filled his ship up full of cod, timber, and thousands of beaver pelts. Now by this time, they had heard about beaver pelts in Europe, in France and England. It was all the rage. And by the end of the 17th century, the beavers were almost hunted to extinction. Of course, they were waterproof, their fur. 
But Thomas Hunt remained behind. And where did he go? He docked at Patuxent, which we call Plymouth today. And of course, he got into many hostile conflicts with the natives uh, and cut off a, a, lead, uh, a sachem's head, stole from them. Um, very dubious man. But just looking at Smith's map, I mean, he's got the Charles River here. He's got the Mystic River. And he's got the coast of Maine and all the islands. I mean, he did a really good job. He's even got Cape Cod. And um, so, anyways, Hunt, Thomas Hunt, took 27 slaves, including Squanto, to Squantum. And he took them back to England. Squanto made his voyage all the way back. He uh, escaped from his slaveholder in England, made his way in a fishing expedition with Thomas Derner to Newfoundland, and eventually made his way back down to the coast to his home village of Plymouth or Patuxent. And the Nauset and Patuxent tribes now were outraged by Hunt's actions, the kidnapping, and they became extremely hostile. And after this, English and French, English explorers and French explorers were no longer welcome in the New World. You come here, we're gonna fight. We're gonna throw spears at you, shoot our arrows, and you're not gonna get a piece of the profitable fur and timber trade. So Smith's bo book outlined his vision for the New World. He identified that region that became Massachusetts, um, the, the Massachusetts River was, uh, Quinobiquin was the native name for it. And then Smith changed it to the Massachusetts River because the Massachusetts tribe was in that area. And then eventually he named it after Prince Charles, Charles River. Anyways, it was ripe for exploitation. As I told you, all the timber was gone in Europe, but they had beautiful soil, they had timber, they had uh, clean, fresh water, which was also rare in England at that time. Cod fish, cod tasty fish, they were everywhere and they were easy to catch. They were real dumb. You could catch them with your bare hands. Beaver pelts. So there was a lot to offer, a lot of profit to be made in the new world. And of course, he said that uh, he identified one spot, Plymouth. He said it was an excellent, good harbor, good land, and no want of anything but industrious people. And again, this is where the, the pilgrims would, in 1620, six years later, choose their spot. But the reason why they chose that spot was because they were out of water, they were thirsty, and there was the town brook there. So, Anyways, you can just see here in terms of um, the, the different federations of natives, uh, indigenous First Nation people, the Nasset on the Cape, the Wampanoag or Wampanoag Federation of a lot of tribes, the Narragansett to the west of the Wampanoag, they were enemies. And this is why Massasoit saw when these men came with these fire sticks, muskets, that maybe it might be a good idea to join forces with them. And in fact, during the great dying of 1616 to 1619, I'll talk about that in a moment, the Narragansett actually socially distanced themselves because they saw uh, members of the Wampanoag Federation dying literally overnight and they decided to go into the interior of uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut. But you have the Pequo, there was a Pequo War in 1637, Nipmuc, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then there's Plymouth. So the original inhabitants of Patuxent were Algonquin Indians who apparently used it as a summer resort. That's what the natives would use Boston Harbor Islands as well for summer islands to fish. Um, and of course, uh, jo Joseph Jocelyn, an early visitor, in the early 17th century said that he watched an Indian boy spear 30 lobsters in an hour, hour and a half and throw them into his canoe, so. Now, the great dying. Thomas Hunt was discredited when he returned to England for taking slaves. He was never given another commission again. He was ostracized, an outcast. But seeing that Patuxent, Plymouth, was decimated by the disease because literally when the pilgrims landed, there were bleached bones everywhere. There was only one remaining survivor to Squantum, Squanto. So I've always thought, and this is during the, the pandemic, that that was ground zero because they were hit so hard and there's no village along the Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine coast up until Northern Maine that suffered that type of devastation and disease. So I've always thought that historians of and epidemiologists have said that the great dying took place from 1616 to 1619. I beg to differ. I believe it began in 1614. Moreover, I believe some man on Thomas Hunt's ship was the one who brought the, the, the 
a plague or whatever it was ashore. Just my theory. But I got the ears of people now listening to that because uh, the, the story is that a, a sick French trapper was brought ashore um, just south of Bangor, Maine, along the coast, and that somehow uh, natives who were trading came down the trading pass corridor and brought it to every village. And just the, the data that I've seen doesn't bear that out. Anyways, um, so uh, again, did they come from the main coast or were there two ground zeros? Um, basically, King James is saying, oh, what a wonderful plague. <laughs> He's not sure. Oh, God is so good to us. He's killed off all the natives and given us this great land. Bang. But here you can see just the different, uh, like the Wampanoag uh, Federation, the Poconocket, that was Massasoit's tribe, the Pocasset. We know them as Massachusetts natives, Ponkapog. Uh, we see them in the signs in our towns, Mashpee, Manomet, Patuxet, Ponkapog, Wessagusset, Neponset, um, Matachi, Monomoy, Nosset, etc. <coughs> Saugus, Nomkeeg, Wamaset. So um, the Abenaki had about 20,000 Penobscot, Micmac, and Passamaquoddy native First Nation peoples who were among the first to make contact with the Europeans. And the first Typhus epidemic broke out among um, Aborigine, Aboriginal people in 1586. So can you imagine the natives on the shore? What is that when they see a ship at sea? What is that? Uh-oh, dude, run. <laughs> so I'm just telling you that the great dying, my theory about basically, I think it, it began actually in 1614, but the native death rate 90 to 95 percent of the coastal indigenous population was wiped out. And even with the Wabanaki, um, they, their death rate was over 75 percent, and I'll tell you why. Now, what was it? They say that they don't know what it was. Um, was it plague, smallpox, or even viral hepatitis? I think it was some sort of plague, actually. And then that there's, that there are cases of smallpox where they actually have the pox in their faces. So, but um, it was called a virgin soil epidemic, and the mysterious disease spread throughout the coastal region following trade routes of the Abenaki, who traded furs for corn and other provisions. And I did a, a talk a few years ago for the Westwood Historical Society on ancient roads um, throughout Massachusetts. And check this out. The animal trails became the hunting trails for the natives, and they became the passageway, like the coastal path from Plymouth to Weymouth was the first road. So all of our roads, you can see, look, that's Route 3A. Oh, look, there's, there's a, you know, 138, Route 1, uh, the turnpike. You can just see that we, we actually built our roads, the old Connecticut um, path, uh, Middlesex Turnpike. They were built on Native American lands, uh, paths, and just showing the different settlements. So I've always been fascinated by that. Anyways, the Native Americans didn't possess the necessary immunities of these animal-borne diseases that originated in Europe and Asia. Europeans and Asians, for thousands of years, lived with animals. Um, chickens, pigs, chickens, pigs, horses, cattle, sheep, and goats. They were not native to the New World. So, and with them came diseases. And we know about you know, swine flu, bird flu, uh, mad cow disease, etc. So... Um, there were other medical historians say maybe it was hepatitis, meningitis, typhus, chickenpox, trichinosis, influenza, and most recently, leptospirosis. But they didn't have the antibodies to fight this off. So we don't know. Anyways, back to the Mayflower. 65 days at sea now. It's the final day, November 9th, November 19th, right where we are now, 403 years ago. Um, the, they see that the sea, the ocean is turning from a deep blue color to that light green that we know off of Cape Cod, a shade of green. And John Smith had called the Sandy Arm Cape James, it's Cape Cod. Bartholomew Gosnold, who discovered uh, Martha's Vineyard, called it Cape Cod. So passengers were delighted. They could see the foliage on the trees. They could see trees. And they were excited when they first uh, saw land. So then uh, Christopher Jones is going to go, go. He thinks that this... Cape Cod extends all the way down the coast for hundreds of miles, and that's when he gets caught in Pollock's Rip. And again, Virginia extended up to what modern-day New York City is, and then this was called New England. So, and then uh, in, within this was the Dutch settlement. So basically, 
they were intending to go to Virginia, right? 1607 was the Jamestown colony, but the winds in the Gulf Stream blew them north and they landed in New England. And of course, they were all looking for the codfish they had heard about, the timber and the furs. And since 1519, 100 years previously, the natives had seen Spanish, French, English, and Portuguese and Dutch ships fishing off the Grand Banks, which is off the coast of uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. So they were used to seeing these um, encroachers. But you can just see here, so Jones came down, went down to the Cape, all of a sudden they got caught in Pollock Rip, right, Monomoy, the currents that are so fierce. If you're a boater, you don't even want to go near there. And he, luckily he turned around, headed north, and they tucked around um, the arm of the Cape into Provincetown Harbor. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon and they decided, thank goodness, uh, Jones turned around and immediately said that, saw that the destruction of their ship was imminent. So, and, and William Bradford in his book says, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger. By 4.30, now that happened at 1, by 4.30 they were already up the coast and they made good time and they were out of danger. And they drifted off the coast of Chatham until dawn the next day, November 10th. And then at this point, to the alarm of the passengers, Jones says, that's it, we're stopping here. We're, we're, we're throwing down anchor here. And, but this isn't uh, where we were supposed to go, Northern Virginia. So uh, it's November 11th. And the Mayflower's anchors dropped in Provincetown Har Harbor at Long Point, right here. Now, 102 uh, passengers on the Mayflower. There were 50 men, 19 women, 33 uh, young adults and children. And only 41 were true pilgrims, religious separatists seeking freedom from the Church of England. And 25 to 30 were crewmen and officers. Now, those bad neighbors. I had one in my neighborhood growing up. The Billingtons. They were just troublemakers in the colony. Um, Francis, the son, fired a musket on board the Mayflower. I think it was the second day that they had thrown out down the anchor, and he almost blew up the ship because there were casks of gunpowder. And uh, then he also climbed a tree, though, and he said, look, I can see uh, uh, another sea, and they called it Billington Sea, and I kayaked there, and I tried to kayak from Billington Sea to Plymouth, I mean, you could do it if you were ambitious and you had uh, a chainsaw, but um, that, they called it the Billington Sea. And in 1621, March 1621, the first spring there, uh, John Billington challenged Miles Standish, and uh, he was punished for it. And he would do this many times more. He was just a whiner and complainer. And then young John Billington, the youngest, became lost in some woods for several days before he was eventually returned home by some natives from Nosset on Cape Cod. Now, they were given trinkets. The story is that they, were, uh, they gave them trinkets and buttons and whatnot to return the kid. But I think that the, the Nasset said, here, take him. <laughs> He's not staying with us. Go. No, no, no. Okay, we'll take that. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Anyways, uh, in se September 1630, John Billington, was, uh, he murdered John Newcomen, and uh, he was hanged. He was the first executed person of Plymouth Colony. And um, Bradford said he was about 40 years old. And then, of course, his wife, Eleanor, she had to sit in the stocks and be whipped for slandering John Doan. So she had to sit, put her head through and her arms through. So that was the Billington. So let's look at the women of the Mayflower. 18 adult women boarded the Mayflower at Plymouth. Three of them were at least six months pregnant. Ladies, can you imagine the toss? <laughs> Elizabeth Hopkins gave birth to a boy named Oceanus during the crossing. <laughs> Susanna White gave birth to Peregrine White on board the Mayflower in Cape Cod Harbor on November 20th. Uh, and then Mary Norris Allerton gave a, a stillborn, birth to a stillborn in December on the Mayflower. Peregrine White would go on to uh, be a famous colonist and participate in the uh, King Philip's War of 1675 and 1676. Anyway, so... The men now, we're going to go on five different exploration missions, right? Probing missions to find out, hey, what, what about this new land? The women stayed on the, on the Mayflower to care for the sick and the young. They were in damp, cramped squalor, uh, limited water, no food. They were starving and sick. And um, because of this, only five women would make it through that first harsh winter. 
So the uh, only record we have of the Mayflower is just about the, the women and that they were at the first Thanksgiving. There's really not much history dedicated to them, and they've been underserved in history. <coughs> His story, not her story, right? So it's a, it's a white, man's, white man's heterosexual Christian history is what we're taught. So, again, we, we have to draw from the recordings, but it must have been just awful for the women there. Susanna White, as I mentioned, she gave birth to Peregrine. A peregrine would become known as the firstborn child of New England, and he was a prominent, became a prominent farmer and military captain during King Philip's War. Unfortunately, her husband William died weeks later in February of 1621. So that winter, the first winter, was awful, 1620 to 1621. Now she had a newborn, Susanna has a newborn son, a five-year-old to care for, the only widow who survived that first perishing, that first winter. And uh, the others that survived were Elizabeth Hopkins, Mary Brewster, Eleanor Billington, and Catherine Carver. Unfortunately, Catherine, who was married to John Carver, the first governor, died in May of 1621. So, again, they were from pilgrim villages in Scrooby, Nottinghamshire, England. And uh, she would, again, marry again, I'm talking about Susanna, to widower Edward Winslow. It was the first marriage in the new colony on May 12, 1621. They would go on to have five children. And Susanna would have been one of the more prominent figures in the new settlement, married to Edward, who was a leader in the community. So she married up, I guess. Elizabeth Hopkins gave birth at sea. His name was Oceanus. But she, he would uh, tra tragically die at age two um, due to the hardship of the new surroundings. Uh, and she survived the first winter to cook the first Thanksgiving feast, but little is known of her origins or what would become of her. And then she married Stephen Hopkins. He was the guy in the Tempest, right, that I talked about, the ship that was wrecked, the Sea Venture. In February 1617, they had a daughter, Damaris. And then they were part of the group of pilgrims known as the Strangers, right? They weren't pilgrims, religious zealots. And they were living in Leiden. So the Strangers, as I said, they weren't religious zealots, not Puritans, not separatists. They were there to make money and work and find a new land. Merchants, craftsmen, skilled workers, indentured servants, and three young orphans. And they were common people. About one-third of them were children. And they were crucial to the colony's success, right? The kids populated. Now, they boarded the Mayflower in Holland, but they also met up with the Speedwell in Southampton. And then they would again stop at Dartmouth before they set off for America. Now, Mary Allerton, Mary Norris was born in Welford. She was around 30 years old when they made the crossing to North America with her husband Isaac and three children. She was an active member in the Leiden Church, and she was uh, pregnant when she left Leiden originally on the Speedwell. She transferred over to the Mayflower. And she and Isaac had already buried a child in Leiden in February of 1620. And she gave birth to a stillborn in Plymouth, December 23rd, 1620. Tragic. It must have been so difficult for a mother. So um, she died herself the first winter of February 1621, but her husband and her three children survived. And four years later, Allerton remarried Fear Brewster, who was the daughter of William Brewster, and they had two children, Sarah and Isaac. And then after the death of his second wife, he moved to Marblehead, married remarried Joanna Swinnerton in 1637, and he died in New Haven in 1659. Now, she's my favorite, Priscilla Mullins Alden. One of the 18 women recorded to have crossed the stormy Atlantic in the Mayflower. She was just a child at the time. She had a hard start to her new life. Her father, William Mullins, died on February 21st, 1621, while the ship was still docked in Plymouth Harbor. Remember, they threw anchor in November, Provincetown, and they had to wait the winter out on board the ship as the men explored, and I'll go over that in a moment. They wouldn't actually land the women and children until the spring, March of 1621. So her mother and brother, Alice and Joseph, died that first winter as well, so she started life in America as an orphan at age 18. All of her family was gone. And she went on to marry John Alden in the Alden house you can visit in Duxbury. And she was one of the surviving women who fought through the hardship to help the colony eventually thrive. She did so much work. She's known for the, the poem, The Courtship of Miles Standish by Longfellow. 
And of course, according to Longfellow's legend, John Alden spoke to Priscilla Mullins on behalf of Miles Standish. He had, Miles Standish was shy, so he had Alden propose to her on his behalf. And she, of course, said, why don't you speak for yourself, John? <laughs> and their graves are right down in Miles Standish's grave down in Duxbury. Wonderful story. But she was a leading figure in the colony. And in 1627, they were living in a house on the hillside across from the governor's house. And John Alden would be in uh, several offices in government, always re-elected, uh, assistant governor in Plymouth. Everyone liked John Alden, a decent, fair, honest man. Mary Brewster, we don't know much about her. She married Elder William Brewster in 1592. We think she was about 51 during the voyage. And of course, she came with her husband and two youngest children. And she was one of only five reported adult women aboard who survived the first winter. And she was still alive for that first Thanksgiving, 1621. So they're moored in Provincetown. They have to hammer out an agreement, which is formal and binding, some sort of constitution of rights. It, a lot of people argue this is the first US constitution. They called it the Mayflower Compact. And without this agreement, they knew that life would be catastrophic. They needed a functioning social structure to ensure their survival. Um, 41 male, women didn't get a chance to sign it, male colonists, including two servants, signed it, and nine men abstained. But essentially, the compacts uh, established that the, they had to remain loyal subjects to King James, even though they didn't like him. Um, they would create and enact laws, ordinances, etc., for the good of the colony, and then abide by the laws. And they would create one society and work together to further it. They will also be Christians, and it was important because it was the first document to establish self-government in the New World, and it remained active until 1691, until Plymouth Colony became part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So Bradford, in his first morning in America, quote, but here I cannot say, stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at his poor, this poor people's present condition. His colony, they're all ragged and dying and sick. In the next four months, half of them would be dead. Um, William Button died in the Mayflower November 6th. Ellen Moore died of illness as well. This is down in Provincetown. Five died in the Mayflower while she was anchored in Provincetown. The names here amongst them, Dorothy Bradford, who I told you fell off the ship or might have thrown herself off the ship. So the anchor there, November 11th, we're going to use this map and just walk you through. Um, and they fell upon their knees, according to Bradford, and blessed the God of heaven. Land ho! Now they wanted to explore it. They had a shallop, which was a smaller boat. 16 men. Um, and they used one of these two boats. It was about 21 feet long. And 16 men were in it. And essentially, uh, they briefly came on land, which is now Provincetown in Cape Cod, known as First Landing. <coughs> in the booklet, Mort's Relation, Edward Winslow who would become the third governor of Plymouth, shows a map where the first steps in the land were supposed to have taken place. And it's marked today with that stone at the end of Commercial Street in Provincetown. You can actually do all these pilgrim sites in one day if you want to drive them. I've done it twice. And always cap off the day with Pilgrim Monument on Provincetown and John's foot-long foot -long hot dog stand. There we go. So first landing, November 11th. Okay, they immediately realized the Cape, hey, the so soil's awful, it's sandy, we can't grow anything. Um, and as Bradford said, they fell upon their knees, blessed the God of heaven, um, and then they went back to the ship before nightfall, but they brought back some firewood. Finally, they could get some heat and start to dry their clothing out. And then they remained in the Mayflower the following day. The first day they landed was a Saturday. On Sunday, they prayed. And on Monday the 13th, limited passengers were allowed to go ashore to bathe. And in fact, after that, that first Monday, in New England, for centuries, Monday was known as Washing Day in New England. Again, they land the first landing, November 15th. Miles Standish and the party here now. They really haven't done any exploring. They're still up on the upper arm of the Cape. And again, these are all the sites, Pilgrim Lake, Pilgrim Spring, where they get their first water, Corn Hill, where they find corn. It's November 15th. They send an overland exploratory party down the sandy dunes of Cape Cod. Three-day expedition right along here. That's their first route. There are three expeditions, the 15th through the 17th, November 27th through the 30th, and December 6th through the 12th. 
So we can only imagine they saw whales in the harbor, and geez, we should have brought those harpoons. Gee, we should have brought those fishing rods. And they saw geese and birds, the, the greatest store of fowl we ever saw. And of course, Standish had the men in light armor march in single file. And they marched about a mile when they, and this is the timeless moment, where they stopped and down the beach they saw six natives and a dog in that timeless moment. And I'm sure the natives, there's a vulgar thing I could say, but they said something really like, oh no. And then they ran off to the woods. This is the real first encounter breach beach. So they whistled. Anyways, they chased after these uh, natives. Um, they, in their armor, tree branches hitting them in the face. Um, they pursued them for seven miles, and then they decided, hey, let's camp for the night. We're not going to catch them. And the natives melted into the wilderness. And they posted. They had a fire that first night on the 16th. The next morning they woke up. They saw their first deer, but their chain mail, their armor, was torn to pieces. Now they're thirsty, no water, no beer. They had this crude alcoholic beverage with them. And they came upon a small hill, and there they found a freshwater spring. And according to Bradford, drunk our first New England water with as much delight as ever we drunk drink in all our lives. And that's the spring there. And it's Pilgrim Spring. I've been there several times um, where the water was. And there still is the little spring down there. And then, of course, they, uh, the second night they stayed at today what's called Pilgrim Pond. And they made another campfire to signal to the Mayflower that they were safe. And of course, on the morning of the 17th, they found abandoned stubble cornfields. They stumbled upon what appeared to be native graves. And, uh, quote, it would be odious unto the Indians if we ransacked their sepulchers. And then they came across evidence that they were not the first Europeans there. They found sawed planks in an iron kettle. Then they came upon the salty tidal Pamet River. And they found the remnants of a fort that might have been Martin Pring's fort in 1603. And on a high seaside hill, they found mounds that were unlike graves that they had examined earlier. They found reed baskets filled with multicolored corn or maize. Back in those days, the corn was only about that long. Today, of course, you can get long, long. Um, thing. Anyways, the Nasa tribe stored their seed corn and grain for the winter months. And that's what they found. So they were starving. They filled up a kettle, a couple of kettle, kettles, and they left a note, we'll pay you back later. So this represents the first act of American credit. But Corn Hill, the area is known as, um, this I went looking for, I finally found it. You've got to go through people's backyards, but this little monument, it's not as out, out now, it's all covered over with grass. There's a plaque here. And I know we're running on time here. And then they land, and then it was raining on the 17th. And then uh, Bradford gets caught in an animal trap set by the natives. Christopher Jones comes back and rescues them. There's all sorts of different um, probing adventures here. Uh, they had 34 men on one of the probes here. They went down the Cape. Um, they're in the shallop. The winds are against them. And... They now, in the second landing, November 28th, where they get the corn seeds, so they're making their way down the arm of the Cape. I know that we're, we're hard on time here. But they're frostbitten, and they see their first snowfall. They're knee-deep in snow, and they're cold. They, all they have to subsist on is the, those handful of corn kernels, the seed corn. And then they finally do manage to feast on duck and geese. They catch some, so their diet is increasing. And um, anyways, with the store, they find more stores of corn. They take it back to the ship. Standish then is there and, um, on the November 30th. Uh, he begins to search for the indigenous people. Now he wants to fight them. Or he wants, I want to know who they are. So he finds another grave site, and what's he do? He desecrates it. I'm not a Standish guy, sorry. Um, and he, they found the remains of a European with yellow hair, uh, a sailor's knife, a sailor's sack, and a sewing kettle. Anyways, um, they find abandoned wigwams. Again, the entire village is decimated by this disease. It wiped out the Patuxet, but not the Nauset. So they ransack the graves, uh, take whatever they can for food. And then Robert Coppin says, I remember a harbor across there. We call it Thieves Harbor. That's where they stole our harpoons a few years ago. He's talking about Plymouth. And on December 6th, they say, let's head out there. But unfortunately, their shallop, um, they want to explore down the, the, the other side of, of Cape Cod. They heard about this area here in Plymouth. They land on December 8th, and they call this First Encounter Beach. 
And uh, after settling 15 miles, um, they observe some natives hacking away at a whale carcass. The natives look up, see them, and run into the woods. And then they see a column of smoke off in the distance. Anyways, a man comes running out of the forest the next day because they slept on the beach, said, Indians, Indians, Indians. And there was a, a bit of a fight there, uh, gunfire, musket fire versus their arrows. They get in their shallop and leave. That's known as First Encounter Beach. There's a real cool, there's a new marker there, but you got to go up on a hill to find the old marker, um, which I guess it called them Indians and said that they called them savages. So, okay, i got to wrap here. But um, they made several other landings throughout Cape Cod. Eventually, they go to Clark's Island, named after John Clark, who was um, one of the men on the shallop. And here they prayed Psalm 61 and Psalm 100. They also elected um, Carver as the first governor there. So they call Pulpit Rock and Election Rock. And again, that's Clark's Island right off the, the uh, Saquish and Gurnet Neck. So that's the true Plymouth Rock is what I'm trying to tell you. I don't believe in the, uh, the other Plymouth Rock. Um, you know, this glacial rock here in the harbor, it's a 20 ton boulder. By the way, the ocean level is still the same as it was in 1620. Just telling you. Anyways, it's been cut in half, bombed. Uh, Mary Chilton, the first European female to step foot on New England. I believe that, but I don't believe in Plymouth Rock. Anyways, um, that it's, it, that's the true Plymouth Rock in Clarks Island. So what I want to do is just wrap up here quickly. Um, they get encountered. They, they come ashore. They build their homes there. Uh, again, disease. They name Carver as the governor. Carver, that spring, um, dies of a heart attack or a stroke. He's replaced by William Bradford. Um, and then they manage to, uh, some of them eat mussels, they get shellfish poisoning, but they don't know how to grow in this soil. And just uh, when the spring arrived, out of the 102 pilgrims that were on board the Mayflower, only 57 are still alive, 17 children, hunger, disease, malnutrition, 18 pil eight pilgrims die in January, 17 February, 13 in March. They're just, um, they would even, they would prop up dying people against trees and put muskets in their hands, as if that would fool the natives. The, uh, the hubris there is just arrogant and naive. Anyways, lost pilgrim children. I know. Spring comes around. It's March 17th. A lot of history there, evacuation day. And into camp um, comes this native. He could speak English, Samoset. And basically, he had been captured. He learned English from some of the trappers. But uh, he's a Sagamore, which is a subordinate chief. And he had broken English, and he says, hello, Englishman. And then the second thing he says, do you have any beer? <laughs> Sarah said he wanted a brewski. <laughs> Anyways, um, he reports back to Massasoit, the sachem. I'm wrapping up here. Um, Massasoit then sends Squanto. Squanto lives. He's embedded with the pilgrims, teaches them how to fish and farm, <coughs> how to plant the three sisters. Three sisters of the three native uh, plant crops, which are beans, maize, or corn, and squash and pumpkins. And basically, he told them where to look for deer at dawn, how to fish, eat lobster. Samoset disappears just a few days later out of the record. And I think, my theory is, that he had had it up to here with Squanto. And like, this guy, I'm out of here. And he went back to Maine because he felt that he was uh, displaced by Squanto. Squanto was loved by William Bradford. Osemaquin had him as a spy. Osemaquin, which is Massasoit, the sachem, didn't trust him. Anyways, uh, Samoset lived in, in Warren, Rhode Island, Mount Hope. And again, as I said, the, the Narragansett were wiped out. Uh, the Narragansett, rather, socially distanced as the Wampanoag were wiped out. That's why Massasoit wanted to partner with the pilgrims. Wait a minute, they have these guns, and that can help us against our enemy, the Narragansett. But Massasoit, an honorable man, the peace treaty that he set with the pilgrims lasted until 1675, but for 50 years, and he was just a, a very humane, decent, honest man. And if it weren't for Massasoit, we're not around. Um, but anyways, Squanto would get involved with the Namaskat raid. He'd go down with a guy named Habamak, another native. They were rivals. And Miles Standish would go down there and kill some of the natives looking for Squanto. Squanto walks out of the woods. Oh, I'm okay. So the three sisters, as I said, let me just go to the first Thanksgiving. Blueberries, cranberries, 
There was turkey there. That was the only really native bird there that they could eat. And then the Mayflower goes back in April of 1621. Nobody has to go back. Um, Hobbamock, Hockamock, the Namaskat Raiders I spoke of is a misunderstanding with the Namaskat tribe, which is modern day Taunton. And then after that, um, Squanto was duplicitous. The West Gusset Master, they called Miles Standish Captain Shrimp. And essentially what he did is he, the two, um, uh, they were called Panises, they were deputy ch war chiefs. And they were, um, and let me go back to that. So anyways, they were, uh, um, John Horrigan is the guy who carved the statue, and that's my name, on the top of Miles Standish Monument. It was a 116 foot tall monument. And then um, unfortunately lightning struck and knocked the statue off, so they had to build another one in 1922. And today these legs, by the way, are in Halifax, Massachusetts. So his statue is up top here, and the legs are in Halifax. Anyways, West Augustine Mass, uh, basically the two, um, a man came running down from West Augustine, which is modern day Weymouth, saying that they're, all the natives are get banding together and they're gonna attack Plymouth Colony. So what Miles Stennis did is a preemptive strike. I hate that term, they're always wrong. But um, pork, the natives had never smelled pork and they went nuts like Wimpy and Popeye when they smelled bacon. <laughs> and so they cooked, uh, Stanish brings in these two uh, leaders, Pexwat and Wittawamit, two strong native war chiefs, the toughest. And I guess it was Pexwat made fun of, uh, called Captain Shrimp. They bring him into this room and then what he does is he pulls out knives and they execute these natives. They, they ambush them, stab them, and they actually cut off the head of Pexua and put it on a pike. And that, that would be outside of Plymouth Plantation for, for nearly two decades. Barbarous. And they just did, a, in 2019, they did a commemoration. And I, what I think happened, there's a woman who reported haunting of seeing Native Americans up on the hill in West Augusta. Okay, so my theory is maybe that's where they were killed, right, where the hut was. And then the bodies they found when they were building the houses in the 19th century, they found two headless bodies decapitated. And I think that was Pexawat and Wittawamit. Just my theory. Anyways, um, we're wrapping up here. Um, Squanto dies of fever, they say, but I think he might have been poisoned because he wasn't. The Nossets up on Cape Cod didn't trust him. Massasoit didn't trust him. Uh, Habamak didn't trust him. So... But he, if it wasn't for Squanto, uh, that we wouldn't be here right now, so we owe him a thanks. Anyways, um, Winslow and Massasoit were best friends. Edward Winslow actually nursed Massasoit back to health. They became brothers. And if he, if Winslow ever knew what his son Josiah, the future governor of Massachusetts, did to Massasoit's two sons, Wamsetta, known as King Alexander, anglicized, he poisoned him at the Winslow house. Yes, he did. Anybody from the Winslow House, I know who you are. Metacom, King Philip was beheaded during the King Philip's War. So I'll never speak the Winslow House again, though. Anyways, a, a huge harvest came, 1621. Now this leads us into the first Thanksgiving. Because Massasoit had sent Squanto and saved him, they had a massive Thanksgiving between the remaining pilgrims and the natives. It, it was it lasted three days. It was a combination of their green corn harvest or a traditional English harvest festival. And of course, they came together, venison, corn, pumpkin. Um, they, they didn't have wheat then because wheat was brought over by the natives. But they, the native women sat with the native men to eat. Meanwhile, the settlers, the pilgrim women, had to stand quietly behind the table and wait until the men finished. And of course, um, uh, there, it's recorded as that, that apparently there was a second Thanksgiving held in 1623. I don't think that happened. After the West Augusta massacre, I don't think that, that there's going to be a party. Anyways, the primary sources for the first Thanksgiving were Edward Winslow, he wrote March Relation, and William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. Just winding up here, I'm not going to read that, but basically that is the first person narrative of the first Thanksgiving. It did take place. It did take place in late fall, 1621, most likely in October. Um, just so you know, Thanksgiving uh, became a national, there were 53 pilgrims, by the way, uh, at the first Thanksgiving, four married women, five adolescent girls, nine adolescent boys, 13 young children, and 22 men. And 90 of Massasoit's uh, Wampanoag tribe. Anyways, as I said, they, 
they celebrated, they had games, they had hunting games, etc. And they actually, I don't think it was that pleasurable with that man with that droll smile, but they ate, ate to their heart's content and clams, etc., etc. And of course, Thanksgiving would become a huge holiday for individual governors um, for the fourth Thursday in November um, and spread across America. It became a national holiday. Um, it was first proposed by Abraham Lincoln, and then it was uh, actually December 26th. They changed it to the fourth Thursday, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the, in the 40s. Of course, one of the oldest spice mi mixes, everybody knows Bell's seasoning. It was invented by William Bell of Newton. And of course, it's, it's the true aroma of Thanksgiving. And then of course, um, the traditions, the Macy's Day Parade since 1924. Of course, COVID interrupted that. The annual Thanksgiving Day football game, I think I might go again this year, Wellesley Needham. At that time, Wellesley was known as West Needham, just like you had West Needham for Westwood. And of course, the Detroit Lions since 1934 have played on Thanksgiving. I don't think he's gonna be wearing a bag anymore. I think the Lions are pretty good. No, 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 no. No, but, but, the, uh, but the Lions are pretty good this year, Jared Goff. And of course, two turkeys, Gerald Ford and the turkey there, pardoning Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. And I think Cleveland gets the lousy chair. The turducken, which is a turkey and a duck and a chicken. And of course, Black Friday. You want to see the human condition, Black Friday. And of course, from this turkey to you, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks to my viewers at home. Sorry I went over. I'm John Horry. Good evening. <laughs>